I'd like to start this video by saying right off the bat that I'm thrilled to have such a group of critical thinkers for subscribers. You are all the cream of the crop. In my last video, for which I will include a link in the description, I presented this graph showing the CPI-adjusted rate of return of all possible portfolios containing mixes of stocks, bonds, and gold from 1971 through the end of 2019 versus a measure of consistency of those returns. And I had questions from people who had taken out their financial calculators, determined the rate of return on gold over that time period, and commented, Hey, Blank P, I'm getting 4%, not 1%. What kind of data set are you using? That's awesome. I didn't want to get into details in my last video, but since people are asking, let me explain. I treated the data very differently because, as we all know, the arbitrary selection of endpoints can make one asset class appears to be much more favorable than another if another time period had been selected. And this is a favorite tactic of people who want to sell gold and also of people who want to sell stocks. Want to make stocks look awesome? Show the 10-year return starting in 2010. Want to make gold look terrible? Start in 1980. So let's see how we can deal with this problem to make the analysis more robust to the selection of time period. Here's a plot of what a person would have experienced if he or she had bought $100 worth of gold in 1971 using CPI-adjusted cash. Over the 49-year time period, the balance would have grown to $670, again, CPI-adjusted. Using a handy financial calculator, we can see that this is just a 4% per year rate of return. At least I'm guessing that that's what the financial calculator would say, because I don't have one. I just use math. I put the equation down below for anyone else who doesn't have a financial calculator. So this 4% is obviously a nice real rate of return. But one could easily argue, hey, you picked 1971 deliberately to make gold look good. And when using endpoints, this is certainly a danger. Whether the person doing the work was being nefarious or just didn't know any differently. So let me show you what I did to make the result more independent of endpoint selection. Rather than just use the endpoints, let's regress all the data from start to finish. If we use a logarithmic plot as I did here, the slope of the line represents the rate of growth. Notice that the line representing the regression starts at a much higher level than the actual start point in 1971. The significance of this is that it removes the impact of luck on the part of the person who started in 71, but it also removes the significance of bad luck on the part of the person who started in 1980 or 1981. When looked at this way, we can remove some of the time variation from the estimated return. Instead of it costing $100 to buy gold in 1971, it would cost $249 to buy the same amount. Again, this is a mathematical fiction, but it makes the result more robust to arbitrary time selection. At the end, the person would sell the gold for $477. This leads to a rate of return of 1.3% per year instead of 4% per year, and such is the peril of arbitrary time selection. To make the illustration much more clear, let's use 1980 as our starting point. A person who had the misfortune of buying gold at this point of time is still sitting on real losses. Of course, this is a technique used by the air quote financial experts to show just how bad gold is and why it should be avoided. Are they being disingenuous or just plain ignorant? I don't know. Maybe there are some in one camp and some in another. I'm not a financial expert, so I'm probably not qualified to say. We can do the same analysis with stocks. Here's a 100% stock portfolio. Just to be clear, I'm speaking about the S&P 500 index with dividends reinvested. If we calculate the rate of return just using endpoints, then the financial calculator would spit out 6.3%. The regressed rate of return is 7%. The reason for the difference is the starting point of 1971. Stocks were on the expensive side that year. Now there's much more to say about this. Notice that just like gold, stocks had a couple of bad decades. A person who bought in 1971 would have real losses for 15 years before breaking even. A person who bought in 2000 also had a bad experience, and it took 15 years to break even in real terms. This problem is much more than just a <clears throat> mathematical quandary over how to make the analysis more robust to endpoints. The real problem is how to make it so that our investor has a reasonable assurance of a satisfactory outcome. After all, the person entering retirement with an expectation of a 7% real rate of return, who gets a 0% or negative rate of return over the subsequent 15 years, has a real problem. 
she'll likely run out of funds before running out of life. And this is where performance consistency comes into play. There are people who study this kind of stuff to death who have a fairly good grasp of what asset is undervalued and what asset is overvalued. And I have my own view of that as well, and that's why I'm a little bit heavier in gold at the moment. But for the person who doesn't want to mess around with endless analysis and who wants to guarantee a reasonable outcome, what are they to do? And that's where the math suggests that a 35% allocation to gold and a 65% allocation to stocks is a reasonable portfolio to adopt. The regressed rate of return of this portfolio was 6.1% per year. It's almost a full percent less than what was achieved by the S&P 500 over the past five decades. But look how consistent this result was. There were no decades with real losses. A person who saved consistently in this mix, through thick and thin, had a very consistent experience. Am I saying that everyone should adopt such a portfolio? No, I'm not. I'm not a financial expert. It would be improper for me to give advice. Plus, I happen to know that it's not possible for everyone to adopt a 35% allocation to gold without gold being priced at a much, much higher level. So please continue to ask critical questions, everyone. I greatly appreciate them. So thanks again.